Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our service this morning. Um, for those who weren't able to maybe just join, it's a particularly warm welcome to Archie. It's great to, uh, to see him out of hospital and, and home uh, so quickly um, after that procedure. Um, yeah, so we hope that everyone is well uh, and that you feel blessed and encouraged uh, by our time together this morning. Um, so as we gather virtually once again this morning, um, I'm going to start our service by reading Psalm 8. Um, as we look to hopefully help uh, read this and help us to, to focus and remind us of God and who we, who we gathered here this morning uh, to worship really. Uh, the God who we are here to learn more about, uh, to encourage us and to challenge us. Um, and obviously learning more about God is exactly what we're doing in our current series, uh, What's So Great About God. Um, Anthony will be continuing that series this morning as we focus on God being um, omniscient. So yeah, I uh, made sure I said that properly. It's one of those A-level words that I remember from my philosophy days. Tricky. But anyway, Anthony will go into more details on that. Um, so I'm going to read Psalm 8, um, and then Dan Carson uh, will lead us in prayer, um, followed by uh, Jennifer Harrison, who's going to bring us our Bible reading today. So this is um, Psalm 8 uh, from the uh, NIV. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, you have been set in, you have set in place what is mankind that you are mindful of them human beings that you care for them you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor you made them rulers over the works of your hands you put everything under their feet all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Um, over to you, Dan. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church at this time and as we continue to meet together in this way. Thank you, Lord, for the different ways you've blessed us in recent months during this period of lockdown. We pray that you'd guide this church and our leaders as with the changing situation in our country, we consider how we can best continue to serve you, to fulfil our mission as your church, to be salt and light where you've put us, and to bring glory to you. As our country continues to gradually open up again, we pray that you'd have your hand on people and speak to them right where they are. For those who are still very fearful of the virus and plan to remain at home for now, may you comfort them. For those for whom the unlocking presents a chance to save their businesses, so they're keen to get back. May you be with them and help them. For those able to access medical treatment which have been postponed, may they feel your presence with them. For those for whom lockdown has been a difficult time and a return to a greater sense of normality is a relief, may they see your provision for them in everything they do. Lord, we pray that you'd continue to grant wisdom to our government in their decision making, where the knowledge that we have as people is constantly changing. And finally, Lord, we pray for those in our fellowship who are, who are sick or hurting at this time. Lord, we pray that you'd be especially close to them, and if you will, grant them healing. 
pray all these things in your name. Amen. The reading this morning is um, Psalm 139. And no, it's not deja vu. It is the same reading as last week. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake, I am still with you. If only you, God, would slay the wicked. Away from you, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them in my enemies. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Well, good morning. It's lovely to see everyone. Great to be together like this and uh, hope we're all keeping safe and well. Thanks to Jason for, for leading this morning and to others for, for taking part. As Jennifer pointed out, we were looking at uh, part of Psalm 139 last week. And we're going to reflect on the opening part of it this week as we think again about the kind of God we know and serve. I was, you might find this difficult to believe, but I was mostly a good lad when I was growing up. But every so often, I'd do something that I shouldn't do. And I was always amazed at how quickly my mum would find out. That's because I have eyes in the back of my head, she'd say. And uh, perhaps you said something like that to your kids. And of course, a few times as a little boy, I'd look for those eyes in the back of their head, but I just assumed they were covered by a hair or perhaps they were special, invisible, all-seeing, all-knowing eyes. And we might sometimes wish that we did have eyes in the back of our head. Wouldn't it be great to know all things? You might have heard this advice to teenagers. Teenagers, tired of being harassed by your parents? Act now, move out, get a job, and pay your own way, quick, while you still know everything. The writer Mark Twain famously said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. 
But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. Now, I'm not knocking teenagers. To be human is to learn. We spend our lives trying to overcome our lack of knowledge in different areas. And we need to if we want to be good citizens, good parents, good cooks, good musicians, good drivers, uh, good at handling computers, good at our jobs. Getting older involves growing in knowledge. But we know that it often also means becoming aware of how much we don't know. I wonder if you've ever said, if only I'd known then what I know now. Who thought at the start of this year that we'd be where we are now? Who knew? But God doesn't have this problem. As Psalm 147 verse 5 puts it, his understanding has no limit. God has never had to go to school. There are no jobs for which he is not qualified. He never gets the wrong end of the stick. He's never lost his car keys or locked himself out of his house. He's never forgotten someone's name. He's never got his words muddled. He's never been worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. He's never been confused or surprised or anxious or frustrated. His knowledge is infinite. He knows all there is and ever will be to know. And as Jason reminded us earlier, we sometimes call this God's omniscience, which simply means all knowing. As John writes in 1 John 3 verse 20, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Over the last few months as a church, we've been asking the question, what's so great about God? And that's our answer for today. God is all-knowing. In particular, I want us to think about two things. First of all, God's knowledge is complete. And secondly, God's knowledge is caring. First of all, then, God's knowledge is complete. As human beings, we want knowledge. Right now, it's for all the quizzes that are going on across the church. The Billington family, we've discovered, is not too bad at 80s music, thanks to Emma. Popular cinema, thanks to me. Uh, ancient history, thanks to Sam. And science and stuff, thanks to Jack. Just don't ask us about animals, sports, or logos of fashion houses, and we'll be fine. We have a desire for information, though, don't we? To know all the facts. Although sometimes we're in danger of suffering from information overload. And some of you will know what I mean. Perhaps you're buying a car or a washing machine or a new computer, and you do all the research about makes and models and check all the ins and outs and go on all the comparison sites. But as you might know, all of that can actually diminish our ability to make a decision. We we suffer paralysis by analysis because there's the sneaking suspicion that there's another piece of information which may call into question our current choice. And, and how would we know? We have more knowledge available to us than any other previous generation, literally available at our fingertips. But we're also painfully aware that knowledge by itself doesn't bring security or happiness any more than a set of instructions for Ikea furniture doesn't by itself build the desk. Because it's not just about having knowledge. It's having the right kind of knowledge. But it's not even about having the right kind of knowledge. It's about applying knowledge wisely. And we're not always sure we can trust anyone, let alone ourselves, to do that. But what if there was one who was infinitely knowing, infinitely wise, and infinitely loving? Wouldn't that be great? What if during this time of pandemic, with all our anxieties and uncertainties, with all our questions, with all our search as human beings for vaccines and cures, what if there was one in whom we could place our trust and be at peace? What if? Well, God doesn't suffer from our problems with a lack of knowledge. 
God's knowledge is complete. God's knowledge is comprehensive. God knows all things perfectly, past, present, and future. God never forgets. And God's knowing is different from our knowing. It's not simply that God has more thoughts or better thoughts or deeper thoughts than us. God's way of knowing is of a completely different order from our way of knowing. God knows everything all at once. He not only knows all that happened and every word that was spoken and every thought that was thought across the entire universe a thousand years ago, but he knows what will happen and every word that will be spoken and every thought that will be thought across the entire universe a thousand years from now. And he knows all of it all at the same time. In the Bible, God himself challenges idols to prove that they are true gods by their knowledge of the future. God lays down the challenge in Isaiah 41. Tell us, you idols, he says, what is going to happen? Declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know you are gods. And then in Isaiah 46, he says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. It's because God knows all things that his prophets are able to foretell the future. God's knowledge truly is complete. The truth is, most of, most of us don't want knowledge to be clever or to be thought of as clever. We want knowledge to give us security. Knowledge helps us with our anxieties. We think knowledge will bring us peace of mind. But rather than obsessing over our own ignorance or trying to make up for it, we can learn contentment in our lack of knowledge because we can trust the one who really does know all things. The one who has no anxieties at all about the future. We can't outsmart God. We can't come up with a better plan. He knows all the facts. And because God holds all knowledge, we don't have to. God's knowledge is complete. That's the first thing for us this morning. But there's a second thing, which is that God's knowledge is caring. And that's what we see at the start of Psalm 139. You see, you can probably imagine someone saying, I'm not sure I like the idea of someone knowing everything about me, e even God. What about my privacy? Has God not heard of GDPR legislation? And in this era of, of big data, when we're rightly concerned about how much companies hold on us, this kind of complete knowledge might sound a bit creepy. And yet for the writer of Psalm 139, the, the idea that God knows all about us is not creepy, but comforting. The first thing that David says is that God knows him through and through. God knows all things, yes. God knows things that we can never know, yes. God knows things that we can never see, yes. But God knows all about us. And it's not a knowledge that suffocates us. It's a knowledge that supports us. I've said this before, I think, but imagine sharing a room or even a house with someone uh, many of us have done that. Maybe you've shared a bedroom with a brother or sister, and you can probably tell us whether they snore or sleep on their back or their front. You can tell us about their most disgusting habits. Or when couples, uh, husbands and wives, share a house, a routine, a life, they get to know one another intimately. Uh, various Mr. and Mrs. TV shows over the years loved asking those questions about which shoe does he put on first and which tap does she run first and so on, just to test how much they really do know about each other. And we can do that as human beings. Now, if we can do that, how much more can God? 
And that's what this opening section of Psalm 139 tells us. It's as if God is our intimate. God knows all about our emotions and motives. In verse 1, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. He knows our processes of thought, verse 2. You know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. He knows our various activities, the details of our routines, our, our habits in verse 3. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. He knows our patterns of speech, verse 4. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. God's knowledge of us is intimate and protective. Look at verses 5 and 6. You hem me in be behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, David says, too lofty for me to attain. God knows everything about us, all the externals, all the internals, all our movements, all our thoughts, all our words. It's not that God knows all things. It's you know me, David says. And we too can know that he knows us. Yes, God's knowledge is complete, but it's also caring. And that gives us assurance and confidence. God's knowledge of us extends to the very details of our lives. What God said about the, the prophet Jeremiah is true of all of us. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. David says something similar in this psalm in verse 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Nothing can happen to us that will catch God by surprise. And so no wonder that after reflecting on God's knowledge of him, David says, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. And yes, Knowledge is power, as the scientist Francis Bacon once said. And yes, if we don't belong to God, his knowledge will leave us nowhere to hide when we face him one day. And that ought to make us fear. But for those of us who know him, his all-knowing is not a cold, mechanical knowledge that simply stores data and runs algorithms. It's an all-knowing that's bound up with his love and his resolve to keep his promises to us. Psalm 139 isn't about how clever God is, but how caring God is. May we, each of us this morning and this week and in our lives, know that love of the all-knowing God. As we close this Part of our time together. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul as he compared God's knowledge and wisdom to a treasure chest. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Just before I hand back to Jason, I'm going to invite us to listen to a song that we've been given permission to play. Let me encourage you to reflect on the words as you listen, which are from Psalm 139, and make them a prayer from your own heart to our all-knowing, all-present all-powerful God.
Anthony. Um, just uh, time now to just bring your attention to a few things. Um, so uh, Miriam's chosen our songs uh, for our service today and uh, just a reminder that they'll be available online uh, on the church Facebook page. Um, a date uh, in the future for your Zoom diaries. So there's a church uh, meeting, uh, members meeting uh, via Zoom and that's going to be on Thursday, the 16th of July at 8 p.m. 
um, house groups uh, continuing this week. Um, so we started a new series focusing on prayer uh, last week. Um, so it'd be great to, to see people join it, any of those. So um, I think still remember there's two on Monday, uh, a Tuesday and a Wednesday house group, I think at the moment. And the links are, are on the, the, um, the newsletter. And also just another thing from the newsletter to um, bring your attention to. Uh, so there is uh, the, the prayer diary, which is attached every week to the newsletter. So this contains um, prayer points for each day uh, for the coming week um, and also continues to include uh, names of members and, and friends of the Beacon congregation. Uh, so just bring your attention to, to look at that um, as you look to try and um, focus your prayer uh, for the week. Um, and finally, a reminder for children and probably more importantly, parents. Um, this is your last week to submit photos of any activities uh, the children have been doing in Kids Church, uh, either with the, the resources that have been provided or during the Kids Church Zoom meetings. Uh, so if we can sit, submit those into Craig or Phil, or Phil um, and they'll be looking to use them for a future slideshow for all to see. Uh, so yeah, don't miss that opportunity. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, bring our time together uh, in a closing in prayer, um, and then we can do one mic. Lord, we thank you uh, for this time together. Thank you for this opportunity to hear your word and to learn more about you, Lord, about your complete and caring knowledge, Lord. Father, in the, in the coming week, uh, we pray that you will strengthen us in our faith daily. Lord, um, renew us, Lord. Uh, continue to change our hearts, Lord, as we look to live for you, Lord. And fill us um, through your spirit, Lord, more and more with the joy um, of knowing that we are saved through Christ. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Um,